Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNET TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNET TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Thursday, April 21st. Our topic today is uh, a resumption of a series we began about a year ago uh, called Lessons Learned from the Pandemic. We had a couple of conversations with folks that looked at uh, you know, what were the takeaways from the experience of the pandemic? A lot of it uh, skewed towards economic and political questions. But today, we're really pleased to have with us uh, an outstanding panel of folks to talk to us about lessons learned from a public health standpoint. It's a, it's a great honor to have with us today Vermont's health commissioner, Dr. Mark Levine, who is joining us from up in Montpelier, I assume. Uh, we're all, we're also uh, very happy to have with us today Dr. Andrew Van Berkler, who is the co-executive director and clinical director of the Battenkill Valley Health Center in Arlington. And uh, also great to have with us today Megan Beatty Kassan, who is the school nurse at Burn Burton Academy. I want to thank you all again very much for making the time and uh, thank you for being here. Um, so to get us started, uh, Dr. Levine, let me go to you first to kind of give us perhaps a, a statewide perspective on this. Uh, I guess if we knew then what we know now about the, uh, the pandemic and how it was going to work, how do you think the public health community uh, would have responded to the start of the pandemic back in March of 2020, a little more than two years ago? Would it, would it have been possible to do something uh, at that time that would have maybe made the uh, impact of the pandemic less severe than it has turned out to be? Boy, that's a great question. You know, looking back, I think it's really hard to think of any changes that might have been made uh, in that very first phase. You have to remember, we've been through the very original SARS-CoV-2 virus. We've been through the UK variant. We've been through Delta. We've been through Omicron. Now we're going through BA2. Every one of these is its own public health crisis <laughs> and its own public health opportunity to learn. So the best we can do when we're dealing with a novel virus that really hasn't affected humans on the planet before is learn from every experience you can. So initially, the goal was treat it like a respiratory virus, which is what it is. And we know a lot about how to manage respiratory viruses. Um, some of which we have vaccines for, some of which we don't, some of which we have treatments for, some of which we don't, um, and many of which we know exactly what they can and can't do to people. But if you remember back to the beginning of this pandemic, we knew nothing about this virus. We knew it was a coronavirus, and we had experiences with many other coronaviruses, some of which were very mild, common cold causing, and some of which were really horrible, like the original um, SARS-CoV-1 virus and the MERS virus. Uh, so one had to assume, if you could, the worst case scenario. And we also didn't even know then that kids would be relatively protected and do very well. So as a society and as a public health community, we very quickly had to do a lot of things because the very first thing we do with respiratory virus is containment. And containment means you can test for it, but we couldn't then. You can isolate people who have the clinical picture, which we could start to do then, but we were learning what the clinical picture was. You can then contact trace those people and quarantine their close contacts. But it all starts with testing, which we, of course, didn't have until we were well into the pandemic. So very hard to say that we would have changed what we did at a time when we learned quickly that you could be asymptomatic and spread this virus, and that we knew we had to protect very vulnerable people, like those in our nursing homes and long-term care settings, et cetera. So we kind of threw the kitchen sink at things with mitigation strategies, avoiding gatherings, closing down various types of venues where people would be gathering more like bars and gyms and things of that sort. And at that point in time, though we resisted initially and there was a clamor for us to quickly get on board, uh, we left schools open, but then ra rather rapidly closed them as well, uh, which seemed to be the right thing to do with the state of knowledge we had at that time. So again, that point in time, that's kind of what had to happen. But then every step of the way since then, 
we've been able to learn. So the UK variant, uh, we had a much more strategic approach. You may recall we abandoned our travel map and we basically reduced gathering size because those were from a uh, data standpoint, what was happening in Vermont to spread the virus. When we got to Delta, we were in a whole new era. It was post-vaccine. When we got to Omicron, we're in a whole era where now where we see this decoupling of cases numbers versus serious outcome numbers. Fortunately, less of the serious outcome numbers, even though there are more of the case numbers. So we all have to grow and learn. Uh, and unfortunately, we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, though I don't have another variant to give you that's coming down the pike tomorrow, keep uh, the experience of the last two years in mind, there probably will be one. Dr. Van Berkler, order you the same question. My, my perspective is really from the primary care side. And I wanna start by saying that uh, the Vermont Department of Health and, uh, and federal agencies, including C CDC, were really um, very forthcoming with data for us as quickly as possible, and particularly with local data from the Vermont Department of Health. I think that was a real win for us. Um, it, it's very different to practice uh, in an environment where you don't have information about case rates and so on. And so as soon as that kind of information became available, I think that was very helpful. And I think that's something that uh, on the primary care side, we have historically had less need to use, but has become very useful in helping practices make decisions about how they're handling sick patients, well patients, seeing patients remotely or in person. Um, and I, I think that's uh, that, that's a way in which we, uh, the, the the public health um, agencies, served us very well. I think at a societal level, one of the things that I was very impressed and moved by was how uh, how much Vermonters look out for their neighbors. And from the beginning, people uh, started. Um, shopping for a frail neighbor, helping them out with needs when it wasn't considered safe for them to go out in public. Um, I think the place where we fell down a little bit was not paying attention to emotional and mental health needs as much early on. Um, and I think our lesson for the future, it's hard to know exactly how to frame this or, or what shape it would take um, but I do think that um, when we're faced with this in the future, we really need to pay close attention to who's alone, um, who doesn't have family nearby, maybe modeling something along the lines of the bubbles that young families made with another family so that you would have just one other family that your children would play with, um, or including the grandparent generation in your bubble. Is there a way for us to think about that? for individuals who live alone, maybe don't have multi, multiple generations in the same area, but who really desperately need social contact uh, and to find ways to do that uh, safely when contact is kind of inherently risky. Um, I think that's an opportunity for us to address in the future. Megan Beda Kassan, over to you uh, to give us the school perspective here. Uh, I mean, what's your takeaway from all of this? Uh, so from a school perspective, looking back to uh, March of 2020, you know, as Dr. Levine had said, we were looking at a novel virus. And so immediately here at Burn Burton Academy, we put together an emergency response team that met and said, what can we look at in our school environment, in our facilities to, you know, help keep students healthy, keep faculty and staff healthy. And traditionally in the school setting and the, and the population health setting, uh, as school nurses are involved in a lot of primary prevention, uh, and often some secondary, but tertiary prevention is somewhat a new realm for school nurses. So looking at the primary prevention, you know, we put in a lot of education on hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette and some of those things that can often uh, not be prioritized by youth, um, especially teenagers. <laughs> um, you know, they have a unique bonding experience where they're not used to having to think about those types of things. Um, moving forward and kind of looking at that time, you know, when schools initially closed down, we were thinking it would be a couple week period, kind of get our feet underneath us and be able to look at finishing up a normal school year. Uh, when they closed down for the remainder of the school year, I think that students and, and faculty and staff alike 
were a little bit shook by that. Um, that certainly was an unsettling feeling. Um, then coming back to the 2021, uh, 2020 to 2021, I'll rephrase that, uh, school year, much of the uh, summer had been spent looking at what sort of interventions and changes needed to take place in this environment. And the school nurses who generally work in an isolated uh, capacity, you know, came together in conjunction with the Vermont Department of Health and our school nurse liaisons uh, to look at how to help guide that, uh, that hope to bring everybody back to school. Looking forward to how we could handle it in the future, uh, you know, like Dr. Levine said, this was a novel virus. We were used to dealing with our routine respiratory viruses. And it's hard to say in a pandemic in the future what we should and could do because we don't know what the uh, infectious period would look like. We wouldn't know what the transmission looked like unless we were looking at a virus similar to one we've seen in the past. Nobody wants this, but if there were another situation like this, again, would there be another way to message things like, yes, face masks are, are effective. Yes, vaccines do work and we'll all be better off if 99.9% .9 of you get vaccinated instead of 65 or 70%. And again, Dr. Levine, I'll, I'll let you get us started on that one. Uh, do you think there's something we could do to break through that, that cultural barrier? I, I do. Um, for perspective setting, I have just, I don't think any of us have seen such polarizing times and such politicization of the issues that we're talking about. Um, and there's always been a segment of society who may mistrust or distrust science, but it seems to be growing. And whether it's the science or the public agencies like CDC who represent the science, um, this truly is serious to the point where we have a current Surgeon General who has labeled misinformation as his number one public health crisis to uh, address. Um, that's unheard of, but clearly called for. Um, I, I want to uh, maintain some humility and modesty, but at the same time say that Vermont has been a little different and Vermont uh, hasn't been characterized to the degree that the rest of the country and perhaps other parts of the world have been with the issue that we're talking about. And I do think there's some fundamental sort of public health communication uh, reasons for that as well as leadership reasons for that coming from the very highest level of government in Vermont. Um, and I guess these words that we use all the time, but they mean so much on this topic, honesty, transparency, uh, consistent and frequent communication, communication about not only the good, but the bad, communication not only about what we know, but be humble and admit what we don't know and why we're making a decision, even if it's based on inadequate scientific evidence at the time. Being timely, being first, and being credible in your communication and discussing what evidence there is. Um, that's sort of what we've done in Vermont. And if you look at the surveys that have been done in the United States, they were done more recently and they were done uh, like a year and a half or two years ago, asking people in every state how they thought their governor had handled the pandemic. And Phil Scott and our team have come out number one on both of those uh, consistently, uh, even though the numbers on the more recent are lower than they were on the first one in terms of the height of the rating, we're still the first, the number one state. So I, I just have to hearken back to the things I've just mentioned in terms of the principles, uh, hoping that that, you know, it's not just that we have a lot more educated people in Vermont and we're smarter than everybody else. You know, I think it's uh, partly the strategy that we used, not that it was that conscious a strategy, it just seemed to us to be an honorable strategy uh, and one that people wanted to have, but that wasn't what they were hearing from the highest levels in the United States. 
And many states, as you are well aware, weren't hearing that from their uh, public health or governmental elected leaders. So that's sort of my response to that. Uh, I'll, I'll let others chime in, please. I, um, I'll concur that the frequency and transparency of, of communication is really uh, important. I wonder if there might be something to the fact that we're a small state um, that makes accessibility of government um, a little bit uh, that, that where the accessibility of our our public leaders um, uh, makes uh, gives people a, an additional sense of trust in them. I've never been in a situation as a primary care doctor or as a director of a health center where I've had such ready access to the state's uh, Department of Health. I mean, you know, certainly no one would have turned me away in Pennsylvania, for example, but it's a very different scale. Um, and I think that um, perhaps the underinvestment that was mentioned earlier, historically, we have been kind of decreasing investments until very recently in public health, that used to be much more present at a county level. And if you think about the larger counties in this country that might be more comparable to this, the population of the state of, uh, of Vermont, if you really invest in public health infrastructure and communications um, at that level, that perhaps you have an edge there. I'm speculating, but um, I, I think that that might be an advantage to consider in the future. I think there's also a role to be played by advertisers. I, you know, I, I believe in healthcare as a public good. I'm very firmly committed to um, to healthcare for all, uh, and I'm I'm you know grateful to be working in a state that's represented by Senator Sanders, who who is really pushing that agenda. Um, but um, in in a world where people rely on commercial information. Um, I have patients coming to me all the time asking for the Shingrix vaccine because they saw an advertisement on television. Well, maybe we need to use that kind of venue uh, to drum up enthusiasm um, for this kind of effort in the future. I, it, it's, it, it, it may be an overly simplistic approach, but it, it might be an addition to the toolkit that could help us next time around. So I agree um, with what's been said so far regarding how, you know, it's kind of a shift of culture in the school setting as well, trying to, you know, nurses have, have long been tracking immunization status and collaborating with primary care offices and the Vermont Department of Health. And I think we saw an increase in that collaboration during this, this pandemic and, and even now after as we start to get ready to prep for our next school year. You know, early on um, in, in child development, children are seeing their pediatricians pretty frequently, you know, from birth through uh, those primary care, mainly because, or primary grades, mainly because of the uh, immunization schedule. There's a lot of vaccines that are administered during that, that time of development. And I had a pediatrician once say to me, you know, as I was trying to collaborate and say, how can we get these well exam forms completed? And how can we get students in you to, you know, to catch up on some vaccines they might have missed? And that definitely the fact that there's less contact points with families, um, with their pediatricians as, as, you know, children age, it makes it challenging. I think we've seen an increase in that, um, you know, being able to, as a school nurse, say, let's get you scheduled with your primary care provider. Let's get you scheduled with your pediatrician. You know, ask them, they're the learned authority, they can help guide you. Um, and really trying to promote that culture of immunizations continue across the lifespan, right? They don't stop once you've met, you know, requirements by age 11 or 12. And so, you know, I think that moving forward, we need to look at vaccination broadly and, and you know, the COVID vaccine is going to fall into that continued uh, requirement or suggested requirement to help uh, decrease the spread of disease. You, you put an important theme on the table, uh, which is the fact that if you ask the public, they, they don't trust anybody in society more than their own personal physician. That's the number one. The health department's very close behind, uh, but, uh, but their own personal physician. And that has been an important alliance we've had through the pandemic is partnering with the physician community at large 
And especially when it came to the kids, the pediatricians and family practitioners at large, because they see them all the time. And though they didn't see them as much during the pandemic, except perhaps on a screen like we're on, at the, the reality was they are still the most trusted voice. And involving that voice, whether it's vaccine choice or whether it's any other aspect of trusting the science uh, and navigating the pandemic was very critical. I was wondering if any of you have heard uh, conversations along the lines of, well, you know, the next time what we need to do is have uh, massive amounts of face masks and PPE equipment uh, stockpiled, ready to go, and a, a reliable supplier of that equipment here in the United States, not dependent on a, a supply line that stretches across an, a couple of oceans. Uh, and I also wondered, is, has there been much discussion of doing things like improving air filtration systems in, in schools or, or public buildings? Because uh, those three things seem to be big factors in containing uh, at least uh, you know, the, the spread of all of, all of the, the virus. And I just wondered, is that something that is being discussed uh, within public health circles that, you know, hey, uh, we need to have this stuff right on hand, ready to go. Even maybe even vaccines uh, kind of in near development uh, to the point where it's a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months to kind of uh, tweak a vaccine to make it be effective. Is, is that a realistic possibility? This is all something I heard in a podcast yesterday. So I'm, I'm kicking it over to you guys because you know way more about this than I do. There's no one who could honestly stare you in the eye and say that this country handled the pandemic well in the beginning months. And that's because of the chronic underfunding of public health, the disinvesting in the public health workforce and in emergency preparedness. And one of the emergencies is not just a hurricane, it's a pandemic. So um, clearly PPE, adequate testing supplies, um, when it came down to it, having enough vaccine early enough because people had to wait in line for vaccine depending uh, on how their state chose to allocate it. Now we're doing the same thing with therapeutics to a, a lesser degree. So these are all important lessons learned. Tons of new money coming into public health. We hope that the uh, memory span of the Congress won't be very short and just have that happen for a couple of years, but it will be looking towards the future in a very robust way. But I'm sure that uh, everyone on this call can talk about the fear that they may have personally had because they couldn't access PPE well at a very early time. And that's really terrible. That should never happen in a country like this. Um, and then the testing infrastructure and how that material got set up. So there's a lot of learning that we need to do uh, and have done. We could be better prepared with vaccine to answer your last question for the next time, but that's a tough one. Uh, we now have a technology platform that is more nimble, if you will, and allows us to do that more rapidly. But many of these viruses that sort of jump from the animal world to the human world, uh, it'd be very hard to predict them with the kind of rigor that you'd have something ready on day one or even day 100. Um, one thing the previous administration, which I did criticize a little um, in my previous comments, do very well was help sustain that vaccine development. And even though Operation Warp Speed made people think the wrong idea and made them concerned it was rushed or whatever, it was a very good approach to getting uh, manufacturers supported in developing vaccines in a very fast timeline. So I presume that would happen again in the future, but I'll let others uh, chime in. I'll uh, definitely second the, the importance of PPE access early on. Um, our, our health center uh, at the time that this all started was staffed by three physicians, one of whom was over 65. Um, and I was just terrified that he would be one of the people to succumb to the illness at a time when we didn't have vaccines yet. Um, and uh, the availability of PPE, the reliance on uh, pure market forces 
clearly is not sufficient. In an emergency, you need some kind of centralized supply. And we were very fortunate um, that the, the state was able to, to send us FEMA allocations of, uh, you know, you couldn't find gloves, gowns, masks, um, you know, one inch needles to administer flu shots that fall uh, for love or money. And so we, we really relied on these, these uh, resources that are funded by all of our tax dollars. And that's really, you know, when, when I, when I pay, we just finished tax season, right? Um, uh, but that's, that's one of the reasons that, that I think um, it's, it's, it's worth reflecting on what our tax dollars pay for. Um, it's really important to invest in these resources because we all count on them in these circumstances. You cannot have a governor of a state like Vermont actually in a competition with prime ministers of multiple foreign nations for the same exact commodity. Mm -hmm. uh, that can never happen again. Yeah, so looking at PPE that we you know, use commonly in the school setting prior to this pandemic, we would have gloves. You know, I would stock maybe a box of, of face masks, the 100 masks that would last the school year prior to the pandemic, um, often for students of international origin that in their culture, you know, if they were feeling slightly ill or if they knew somebody who was slightly ill, allowing access to those face masks, you know, working in other medical settings, that's part of the culture. You know, if you're coming in to be seen, do you have fever, cough, rash, right? Prior to the, the pandemic, that's a common question that would be asked. If you answer yes to any of those, a mask would go on and you'd come in for your visit. So that was the standard PPE we were used to having in the school setting. And, you know, moving into the pandemic, the, the state was, um, as they could gain access to more PPE, we at the school level, we were getting shipments sent to us with gowns, face shields, um, more gloves, hand sanitizer. So we were getting provided a lot of what we needed, especially during uh, this most recent and the school year prior. Uh, so we were very lucky to have a supportive state, even when there was such a deficit for these supplies to really feel like we were supported and getting what we needed. Uh, moving forward, as far as stockpiling, I think that, uh, you know, we certainly will have more than 150 masks on hand for the school year. I, I say that jokingly, but, you know, we'll be able to order ahead of time and make sure we have those because my hope is that, you know, more importantly, we'll shift to a culture where masking will become normalized. And if someone is feeling ill, staying home will become normalized. Social distancing, you know, if we're looking at an increase in a virus, you know, perhaps we just go to a, a remote model for a day or two or go back to that hybrid so we can allow more social distancing in the classroom. You know, maybe some of those things will become more normalized. So as far as stockpiling, I don't see that happening in the school setting, but having supplies on hand and readily available and shifting that culture, I think is, is going to be very important. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to leave it there. There's about uh, 10 other questions I'd love to uh, throw your way. Anyway, I uh, just wanted to say thanks again to Dr. Mark Levine, the Health Commissioner of the State of Vermont, Dr. Andrew Van Berkler, the Co-Executive Director and Clinical Director of the Bad Kill Valley Health Center in Arlington, and Megan Beatty Kassan, the School Nurse at Burn Burton Academy in Manchester. Thank you all for being with us today. And to all of our viewers, thank you for being with us. We hope you found our program interesting today. And uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. Meanwhile, have a great day. Thank you.